following last weekend's madness, it is time to preview the grand finale that is Six Nations Super Saturday. In Wales, Italy, Ireland, Scotland and France, England, we have three fascinating encounters to preview for you. And joining us today to do so and to give some stunning insights into his native France's issues during the Six Nations is former France centre and World Cup finalist Maxime Mermoz. Okay, welcome back to this week's official Rugby Paper podcast episode. We obviously marshal or convene the troops on Monday following the weekend's madness. So if you want a proper reaction to the weekend, do go and check that out. Um, Today, we'll look forward to the grand finale this Saturday, Super Saturday by label, even if we've already had a Super Saturday of sorts. Three matches back to back, as is Six Nations tradition. Four teams can still win it technically, um, France being one of those sides. And then obviously the Wales-Italy game is a huge one as well. One of those games is Le Crunch, and joining us today after a few technical mishaps, but we got there in the end, um, former France centre and World Cup finalist, Maxime Mermoz. Can you hear me, Maxime? Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm sorry it's hot in France. <laughs> no, no worries. Well, we're very jealous. Um, <laughs> look, let's get straight into it. I won't sugarcoat it. I'm not sure you'd want me to, but before you guys won against Wales, it had been a very poor Six Nations, I think you'll agree with me in saying. Just give us your sort of general thoughts about what's been going on um, with Le Bleu. Yeah, for me, the, the three first game was a three lost, you know, three lost game. Uh, we was very, very lucky against Scotland because the the ref decision was a bit insane and everyone <laughs> in France was... a. Uh, you know, like a bit surprised, and they say, "Okay, we support the Les Bleus, but it's a joke." There is how, how I can say no try. Well, it was good for France, but it's like uh, you know the tree who, in front of the 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 the, the, the forest. Say the 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 level, the, the team level is very average because they they lost confident. They beat. Uh, they have like a. A trauma, like a trauma since the last World Cup. But for me, they start to lose something since uh, 2022 because the individuality, talent, help the team. And we, we, we start to lose in November 2022. Sorry. We start to lose uh, uh, our, our team spirit. And uh, we play like uh, worse and worse because... Uh, it was uh, not like a, a, a team, but individuality. The, the example, it was uh, France, Australia, in uh, Stade de France. And uh, Australia was uh, better physically, technically, strategy. And uh, Damien Penaud saved uh, the, the game at the, at the end because he stepped uh, three guys and... Uh, and score in the corner, and uh, we won. But for me, as a, a, a rugby uh, as a rugby game, it was really poor, and uh, there is no. We, we start to lose the, the spirit, you know. And thanks to the French flair, uh, we 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 stay uh, we stay dangerous team. But uh, unfortunately, uh, after the the quarter final, the World Cup. I say to in private, huh? uh, be careful because the Six Nation will be really, really tough for the game for the team. And you start by uh, Ireland, like uh, in Marseille, the pressure was on us, and uh, you know we miss a lot of uh, good players. We had uh, a lot of injuries, uh, so it was a nightmare. And normally against Italia. Thanks uh, God, I don't know. Maybe blow on the uh, on the ball uh, on the garbage ball, but for everyone it's like a, a, a loss. That's why we we can have a, a, a player like a Meafu, like a young young good player, physically, technically, they have no trauma from the World Cup. So it was a I think a, a new start against uh, Wales and uh, the score. Uh, show uh, the new the new spirit because uh, I think they need a few games uh, to uh, I don't know how to say digere to you know? manage yeah yeah uh, to manage uh, the World Cup 
Yeah. Maxime, this is very interesting from a Frenchman. So you, you even before the World Cup, it sounds like you were a little bit worried that the France. We were saying France are favourites, but you already saw a weakness developing. J'ai pas entendu la fin. Uh, D'accord, je vais expliquer. Uh, Brendan a dit que um, c'est intéressant d'entendre um, quelqu'un de la France qui dit il y avait des problèmes avec um, le rugby français yes. um, avant, yeah. avant le World Cup, quand nous avons dit avant le World Cup que um, la France était les, les favorites. Oui, uh, um, you know, uh, I comment for being sport and it's hard to be, to say bad thing because people think uh, you, you negative or, you know, but when you're, you was player, you, you, you can see what, what happened on the field and off the field. And the thing is, I, I like to, to, to look, to worry about the, the behave of the player. And for me, there is a lead, leader and a ta talented uh, players, but some, some other are, for me, average, but they think they're very good, you know? Mm. That's the, no, but that's the problem. And when you have like a Dupont, Beno, or player like that, you know, you just need to be a straight, a regular player. You don't need to be uh, exceptional. And it was the problem. If the opposite team uh, can analyze how you play and uh, what your 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 <laughs> your your weakness and uh, your strength, I think we was ready to 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 earlier. And more we approach from the World Cup and better the, the team play against France. Like a friendly game, Scotland-France. It was really hard to play Scotland. Uh, we beat uh, South Africa one year before the World Cup, but they had uh, like a red card after 10 minutes. You know, we, we was really close to lose against Italy in Italy in the last six nations. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there is a lot of warning, but we continue to say now uh, that's it in France. Uh, we have the public, we have energy, we have talent, we have everything. But for me, it was like an overconfident, you know. And yeah. uh, and for me, it was it. I was really scared. And I thought we have uh, like a big problem in semi or final, but not before. And uh, and what it doesn't help the team, we had we have a a weak pool, you know, really really weak. Yeah. Uh, New Zealand, we play one half, we just defend, and the second half like a counter attack. After Uruguay shit game, uh, the I don't remember uh, Namibia, it was like a. The, the the young team in a second ha second division team and uh, Italia was uh, eliminate and they they lost uh, 100 points against New Zealand so you know you never work like a like a okay uh, like a strong opposition to practice for the for the playoff like uh, South Africa play uh, Scotland they play Ireland you know yeah. So there, there, there was, there was maybe more involved, and the atmosphere, you know, doesn't help them because there was away from, uh, yeah, from France, but because the atmosphere doesn't help uh, the French team because they, they all think there was a superstar. Yeah. Do, do you, do you, do you uh, think, uh, do you think Maxime, uh, because France now has so many big, big forwards, huge huge physical specimens and Galtier now is picking them all <laughs> with us with 6-2 on the bench almost every all your biggest forwards are now in play and you can make the change after 50 minutes or 55 minutes and you're still as big and you're still as physical coming onto the field do you think that's a change of approach now from Galtier 
do you uh, do, does it worry you that you're 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 putting the very biggest forwards you can find in the match day squad? I think he's trying to. I think he's trying to to find the best balance between uh, physicality and uh, speed. The the quality of French team is uh, they can play and they can adapt. The thing is, we have a lot of physical players, but we ask them in a championship in top 14. We ask them to to run. We ask them to to play with hands technically, you know, to read the situation. So I don't think he's looking for physicality, but it worked during uh, during three or four years. And uh, for me, the the game plan was the first 20 minutes. You score so fast. I don't know if you remember all mm. the, the French team game, but after 10 or 15 minutes, they score three tries, few uh, penalties. So they so it's like you start the game with a 20 point, um, yeah. 20 point, you know. And after the, the team in front, the opposite team, but because they uh, they master they master how they play as a team. And they try to come back, and after 60 minutes, always they, they come. You know, uh, I remember New Zealand, France, New Zealand. Maybe uh, the 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 momentum was for the New Zealand and Peno intercept. Yeah. Against Ireland, uh, it was the same, like a 20 point in uh, 15 minutes after Irish Irish team came back in in, in the game, and uh, I remember like uh, a ruck. Uh, like a contra rock and they score, you know, I, always there is a, a lucky thing, lucky thing, you know. But if you don't score fast, we can see it's really different. That's why I think he's looking for physicality, maybe to to smash, to 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 put pressure, to destroy, and after to 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 do the the substitution uh, uh, earlier in the game. But when you miss the physical player, where is the 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 team uh, the the teamwork? You know. Sure, sure, sure. It's sure when you have uh, the player to play like that, it's it's easier. It's easier. You can you can you can make uh, you can see uh, last weekend against uh, Wales during uh, 50 minutes. You know, they can resist. Uh, Wales can resist, but after it's like there is no no gas uh, no gas in uh, in a car. Yeah, and yeah. in France they have better bench. You've spoken quite a lot about Fabien Galtier um, quite recently, and you said that. Well, I'm taking this quote slightly sans context, but you said "il prend tout le monde pour pour des cons," um, which means basically he takes everyone for idiots um well a slightly ruder word than idiots that i won't say um but just talk about what you meant by that and how galtier has spoken after the defeat to ireland the narrow win against scotland where he he called it one of the greatest wins of his career which a lot of us sort of raised our eyebrows at um just talk about how he's managed one the france team but also the general public during this six nations yeah, I think he, he was in bad position because after the World Cup, everyone, because all of the French world, rugby world, uh, give give all chance. You know, the club uh, let the let free the player to to practice for French team. Uh, everyone helped the French national team, and it was like a a big trauma and a big disappointment. So. It's normal after they ask why to the to the coach, and instead of to say to ex, to try to try to explain, you know what he does, what he what he, what he did, he say, oh, uh, since I'm a coach, we have like eighty percent of a victory. But it's not, you know, it's always talking about what he he does well. He's so beautiful. They play. Uh, the, they play like a god. Uh, everyone uh, support the team. Everyone loves the team. You know, 
that's why I say it is it, it, talking bullshit and everyone is a bit upset because okay we all uh, agree to say the French team give emotion positive emotion and we support and we are all proud but he, he, he failed <laughs> he failed so and it's you know it's like a d deny he deny he failed and he said okay I'm beautiful you know uh, we, we play good uh, we have 80 percent of uh, winning I say okay but we, you fail why why you don't try to explain or you know and the journalist start to to lose patience patience yeah mm -hmm. and uh, and after Ireland what I hear what I read it was like a, a joke a big joke he said uh, at the half time he said uh, we 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 give uh, all point to the Irish team I said no you just defend what during one half so you never had the ball you you play maybe one action so I think he's always uh, trying to avoid the real problem, you know. And okay. uh, like after Scotland, he say we play well, and we are happy and proud. I say, I, I, I remember when we won uh, forty-five points against All Black. He was like uh, upset. Uh, we can play better. Uh, we need to improve. Uh, <laughs> but when you you know you know. For me, is it's it's just acting. He's a good yeah. actor, and uh, I'm I'm pissed. Well, could, could, could I ask Maxime? And you might have to translate this for me, Ollie. I mean, I I, rem I remember Gautier as a player in '99, and when the French against expectations, after a difficult start in the World Cup, reached the final. There was the famous game against New Zealand, and at that time, Gautier. Yeah. Divided opinion. He was quite a controversial player. He was quite. He was regarded as quite a difficult individual. And there were people who liked him. And there were people who didn't like him very much. He was quite divisive in that way. It strikes me that it's the same as a coach. Does he have many sort of friends in the game? Does he have a, a big support from from fellow coaches and? players in the game. Do people like him in France? To be honest, all people who work with or for him, they don't have a good opinion. The only thing we can say is he loves rugby, he's a good technician, mm. but as a person, he's a, a nightmare and doesn't... Yeah. Does, no, but for example, I was in the stadium for in Marseille against the island. Uh, someone, she she works, she used to work with him when he was a Toulon coach. She told me he was the Toulon coach, you know, like it was a home game. And for the, you know, after, uh, like uh, with the partner, there is a big reception and uh, the coach uh, talked to everyone. He came after the game with a, I'd say, hangover. Yeah. Straight after the game, because he was happy and uh, he he earned a bit money uh, from uh, something, and he was drunk. He was drunk, and in, they need to call the security to evacuate him from the reception. Imagine, it's it's a it's a shame, but. You are. It's, it's. It was a home game. You are the head coach, and you you talk shit on the stage, and the security need to, to you know to 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 put you out. You you know that it's a symbolic. You know, mm -hmm. he think or he pretend to to be a gentleman, but for me inside, it's a, like a arrogant. Arrogant is really arrogant because when you when you give listen to everyone every day, every time, you know, it's because you're arrogant. And every player who, who play for him in Montpellier, in Toulon, they say he never respects someone.
in national team it's different because you you don't you don't uh, coach the guy every day no so you just spend good time you know for three week few weeks and you have assistant coach and the assistant coach they are really human you know like a servant like a labit like a all assistant coach they look after the player they they create like a uh, a link, a big link, and it and maybe it change uh, his way to manage, because you know he, he, he try to to put like a like a friendship with a relation with a with a player because it's easier because you don't see the guy every day you don't need to look after the family you don't need to look after you know after after them every day sure. I think it's a I think it's a good it's a good. Uh, Compromise for him because uh, he's good as a technic technician, but the thing, I think ego came back at the surface. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. What do you make of the difference then between um, and what you're saying is very similar to actually what I've heard Johnny Beatty say about Fabian is that as a technician he's absolutely fantastic, but in terms of building those individual relationships with players, both for the France team and for Toulon, Montpellier, etc. But he then spoke about Philippe Saint-André, who he said that Fabien probably is a better technician, but Philippe, he makes you want to play for him. He makes you want to win for him. Obviously, you played under Philippe um, when you were obviously playing for the France national team. What do you make of that sort of distinction? Between... Uh, entre Philippe Saint-André um, et sa capacité pour um, gérer les relations avec les joueurs et celui de Fabien aussi. I think uh, it's just my opinion and my experience because I love uh, human behave. <laughs> Philippe, I, I say in a, something in a podcast is uh, how to say. Uh, not brave. Courageux. Yeah, not not brave. Oh, um, Be okay. Because yeah. when he was coach, he was scared about everyone. And if you want to talk to him, you need to talk to a, a third person to talk to him. I think he changed his way to 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 have the relation with the guy. In, Mo in Montpellier, when he was in Montpellier, because he's not enough in Montpellier. But I think it's two ambitious guys, you know, Fabien and uh, Philippe. Technically, I think I think Fabien is better, but I think the 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 comment the weak point of these two guys, it's uh, human. Okay. Okay. I don't I, I I don't say it's bad person because I think when you're a friend with them, I think it's it's a good friend. I think they they are funny. You know, you can you can spend good time. You know, but in uh, the rugby uh, in the rugby uh, relation, it's really hard because they so ambitious. Ambitious, they are ready. You know to. To do maybe bad thing just to save uh, and to stay, you understand? Do you, but do you... I respect. But I respect because they was, they are, or there is, or I. Uh, but they was a. Uh, they reach uh, as a head coach French national team. So congratulations. But I, I have no. Uh, comment on peut dire uh, no admiration. Yeah. Just respect. Respect, but not admiration. That's a big do, difference for me. Do, do you think, Maxime, and this is this is not just the case in France, that there are examples all over the world that sometimes the very best coaches at that time for test rugby, they're, they're, they get the job too late when they're too old, when they've lost some of their energy or they've lost some of their influence. So think of Guy Noves who was, I mean, 
the way we saw him in England and the, the, the way we'd become used to Toulouse success was a fantastic yeah. coach, a wonderful coach. And he came to France too late yeah. to be... Uh, Rob Jefferson, um, yeah. Is that fair? But you know why? You know why? No. Be because uh, I play for Guinness when I, uh, when I arrived. Uh, I was young in Toulouse. Mm. And I had him when I was in the uh, French team in 2016. So, uh, Guinness for me was like a big, uh, like a, not my mentor, but he, he was like a big mentor for a lot of players. A big influence. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing, he was the king in Toulouse. Yeah. And he stayed until to, to dive in Toulouse. And when he was so deep, he said, okay, I'm okay for the French national team, you know, but it was too late. It's like, it's like when you have a big business, like a, you know, when you have a restaurant, you have success. And when you are at the top, it's time to sell. Him, he wait, you know, to, 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 to be in the bottom to sell the restaurant. It was too late. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I think I think he doesn't want really want to to coach uh, the French national team because he was scared to lose everything, and uh, he stayed in Toulouse because he he, he controlled everything in Toulouse. Sure. You know, the the best friend was the uh, on the on the board to decide everything. If someone is a uh, can be uh, can can help the team up, he fire him because he want you know he. He want he, he want he wants to be the the, the chef the chief yeah the president Buscatel so no wave no wave just take your money okay good talk let let me let me manage uh, the the club and when you won trophy what 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 you can say congratulations that we are the best but that's why I think uh, when Bernard Laporte was President, he fired him. They was in a in a court, like a big, uh, big uh, trouble. He won, but even if he won money after the the to be fired, I think ego and uh, comment peut dire. It was like a humiliation for him. Yeah, we don't talk about money. We talk about ego, and it was a big humiliation because he. he, he the new generation can be a coach like the whole one. And, uh, and he failed too. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. Eh? Yeah. What do you make then? Obviously, we've been speaking about basically man, man, man management quite a lot. And there's been a sort of rumor in the press this week about Cameron Wokie. And the fact he obviously wasn't selected and he seems to have fallen out of favour a little bit um, since the World Cup. Obviously, we've set, mentioned that France are now picking their biggest players and he's, you know, he's not as big as Pasolo, Tuolangi and Emmanuel Meafou. Woki was supposed to go to Cardiff as the 24th man, but he didn't. He went back to his club. So what do you make it? Do you think that's maybe a sign that amidst all this potentially poor man management in France camp that there are some problems. Alors, to be honest, I saw like a title in the paper where uh, we explain uh, why Woki preferred to play for for Racing instead of uh, to be a extra player in uh, Cardiff. And uh, I know uh, I know uh, uh, Toulon was upset because normally if Toulon uh, can take uh, like an uh, international player, they're not allowed to play, or you know they they let team uh, they let team uh, with the French national team. So, and Toulon uh, lost uh, uh, in Racing uh, 26. I don't know. I, I I didn't see the why why he preferred this, but we talk about a player, talented player. Woki is a talented player, but he's a nut. His brain. It's like a nut because, you know, but I, I, I'm okay. I, I, I make like a, a really, really good paper on him in Media Olympic, you know, the, mm. the, the yellow paper. Yeah. 
because he was so uh, talented and uh, in he played like uh, New Zealand uh, with Bordeaux. Every games he was uh, he was he was good. And maybe few few weeks later, he, he do some stupid thing out of the pitch, you know. And the thing it's now rugby is, is uh, like a trendy. So there is big brand, Instagram, sponsor, sure. and they all think they're a superstar. Ma Ma Maxime, can I, can, can I ask you um, one question um, about, um, about centres? Um, you know, the great French tradition to me is, is, is you know, you, you have, you've had the greatest centres ever for decades. Do you think... Um, Tell me how good is Emilien Gaton? Uh, forgive my pronunciation. And how good is Deporter? And will they at the next World Cup be twelve and thirteen for France? Amazing, uh, Gaeton. I bet on him before the World Cup. I say normally he will be involved, so he make like uh, the prep. But I think that it's like a bet for the for the team, say, and they pick uh, Biel Biarré. Like as a young player, yeah. mm -hmm. but Gaëtan is not so far. And the Porter, he played the, the World Cup under 20. He was so good because he's tall, he's fast, good step, and you know, they're not shy. They like to play, they like to, to have a responsibility. And I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a pleasure to, to, to see them uh, play because they, they play with a smile, and they give they give a smile when you when you when we support them, and uh, thanks to the bad result of the French team, they pick them. It's always like that. You need you need to yeah, sure. to have the opportunity, and uh, and I'm really happy to to see them because uh, in the top fourteen, I watch the game and they play really well. They fast. And the good thing is uh, the Porter like to play 12. And me, I'm pissed to see number 12, like um, 110 kilo. Uh, you know, they need to destroy. To, to You just need clever men. You just need a, a good hands man. You need good step. You need... When you speed, you always can uh, be physical. And they all may be uh, quite tall. And really athletic and a uh, good mobility. Yeah. They can kick, they can do everything. I think it's a really, really good uh, good for the for the future. I love them. Yeah, great to watch. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Will, 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 will we ever see Max, Maxime another Didier Cod on you? Or is nobody that small ever going to play at number 12 ever again? <laughs> Well, Maxime just shook his head. Um, yeah. So I, th I think there's your answer. And yeah, no, sure. Um, yeah. Maxime, I, I know you're roasting in the car, so I won't keep you too much longer. There are just two more, well, three more things I want to ask you. The first thing is about um, the fly half position. Obviously, the Mathieu Jalibert and Romain Tomek debate has been going on for three years now, and we've always sung Jalibert's praises on the podcast until this Six Nations in which we, we've seen a, maybe a different side to Jalibert's game. Um, do you think France are missing Untermac in that when France are on the back foot and they're having difficulty and they're struggling, Untermac is able to manage a game and marshal the troops in a way that Jalibert isn't? Don't talk to me about Jalibert, please. <laughs> Is, uh, you know, just, I give you a, a clue. He, he is or he was a good friend of Wookie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are both talented talented players. But go on Instagram. The, because they go to Louis Vuitton fashion show, they go in Marrakesh with famous people. They think they are famous and talented. They miss humility. Yeah. That's all. They have talent. They have talent. Mm. But they miss 
humility. And I play with Entamac, the dad and the son, and Ramos. And to be honest, I love to play with Entamac, but Ramos, Ramos is, I'd say, underrated. Yeah. Hmm? Because he's so important in a game because he talk a lot, he decide, he read, he has a, he can do everything. And the best thing it's Jalibert injury because Ramos he play for the team. Yeah. He can he can uh, manage Le Garek because because Le Garek is really excited the player. Oh, good you player. know? Mm. And yeah, good, but you know you need to calm down sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but the, the good balance is Ramos is he has more experience and he can calm you know, against Wales, sometimes, maybe with another fly half, you play more and more and more and more. But no, just one kick in the corner, you know, to put pressure, you know, he, 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 he gives confidence to the team. And mm. French team miss and Tamak, but Ramos is so good. So I'm, I'm not stressed for, for, for them, but. We see uh, Lucu and uh, and Jalibert. They they have uh, three games to to try to to for to 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 put uh, like a Dupont and Tamac uh, in the memories, and uh, they think it was uh, opposite. Yeah. yeah, didn't happen. But it's a good way of putting it. But 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 yeah. the 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 worst thing is they play well with Bordeaux with UBB, mm -hmm. and they they they. They score a lot. They play well in the European Cup. And in top 14, they're really good. So we can see the difference between the top 14 and the, and the international uh, level. I just want to ask you about your predictions for the weekend. Obviously, despite everything you've been saying about France, you've said to me that France are going to win against England by 20 points. <laughs> um, obviously... Yeah. England. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's prediction or, or hope. <laughs> but the thing is, they 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 decide to change the, the mentality. They they mentality, and uh, they put ball on the on the table against Wales, and they're really, uh, I'd say, uh, not confident, but. Uh, uh, they really want to 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 win home. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. They just want to win home. Now yeah. they say, okay, we won uh, in uh, in Cardiff. It's okay, but I think they want to 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 have the love of the of the public. And uh, when when you play with family, friends, or home game, it's always different. So I think they have a. They have a power. They have everything to, to like a declick, you know, like a declick yeah. in the mind to 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 do something good. And I'm not sure about the England team. They play not bad, but uh, 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 English team looks uh, heavy, you know, not not mobile, you know. Mm -hmm. the, they, they look heavy, strong. They love. Uh, to, to, to go at the at the gym, but that good player like Oli Lawrence or you know I love the this kind of player, but the forward I'm not sure about the 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 the, the forward. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so you've gone thirty five seventeen as your prediction, and the only other prediction I wanted to ask you about, and this is the last thing I ask you, I promise. You, what you think Italy are going to beat Wales in Cardiff? So just talk me through that one. But they, they, for me, they beat France. Yeah. They play well in Ireland. I don't, I don't know if you remember, but it was like a tight score until the the seventy minute, and they won against Scotland. They are full of confidence, and Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, it's really different. So, what do you think? 
No, I agree. I mean, we the, all... the momentum it's it, it's from Italy side. Yeah, yeah, we've all got Wales to win, but we did our scores at the start. Evan le Tournoi. Alors, we would have probably changed. Well, moi j'aurais changé ma prédiction si je pouvais, mais je peux pas. Alors, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Maxime. Um, by all means, get going. I don't want to keep you in the car any longer, but thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, and yeah, bonne chance pendant le weekend. Um, and so if France end up winning, maybe we can get you back on, on the podcast. Yeah, pleasure. And I'm sorry for for the for the car because if I lost everything too hard. Uh, my uh, airport, everything. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, no, you played a blinder, like, Maxine. Like, like Thank in, you very much. Like, like on the pitch, adaptation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> adaptation amidst adversity. Well, ciao, Maxime. Take care. Thank you. And, and don't forget, God saves the king. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He Good needs, luck. Good yeah, luck. Yeah, this from a Frenchman. Yeah. Good luck. See you later, Maxime. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah. Well, um, let's get your reactions to all of that. There was quite a lot to digest there. Uh, Cameron Wocky and Mathieu Jalibert think they're world-renowned celebrities or act as if they are. Fabien Galtier is... We well, had some quite choice words about him as a person and nobody likes well, him. We've hinted, we've hinted at that in the past, haven't we? Or, yeah. I, I probably have. That you know, I, I had quite a bit to do with Galtier back in the day when he was coach of Stade Francais. Um, and he, I mean, he would be the first to accept that he's, you know, he is, uh, he is not everyone's, uh, cup of cafe. Um, no. I, I, you know, and, and, and everything we read about him, his career, his career tells us that he is, he is, a he is a prickly character, uh, Gautier. And, and you can imagine that when things are going wrong, the prickles, uh, are pretty evident, um, and 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 of course the, the the people who he's not got on with in the past are queuing up or were queuing up pre Wales to to really criticise him. I mean, it didn't take long for the critics to come out of the woodwork and 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 start chucking things at, at, at Galtier. But wasn't it interesting from Maxime? And I hadn't really thought about it like this, but I I get the feeling he genuinely had worries well before the World Cup. Mm. He he wasn't as impressed with France as the rest of us may be. And I think what he was sort of saying is that, you know, two great players, well, Dupont and Tamak's very good moments he produces were, and Penno were papering over a lot of cracks that he could see anyway. And uh, thinking back, he's right. You know, those fantastic autumn international wins, they had um, Australia, he mentioned, with the, the late Penno try. And in even the previous autumn, they had late, late wins, didn't they, against South Africa, was it even New Zealand? It was all harem scarem stuff. It, the results could have gone the other way. So, you know, perhaps I think he's onto something there. Um, they you see, you sometimes get suckered in on that, don't you, Brendan? That, that, that sometimes we feel it's a mark of a good side to get out of tough games. Yeah, that's tough. what we write, isn't it? You know, look you at say, that. They got out of it and they won. You know, we, 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 we all get used to France having, having a good day and winning by 30 yeah. uh, and tripping the light fantastic. And suddenly you've got a French side... Um, um, and we we tend to think of that is is um, a, a mark of a better discipline mm. and a better application, um, maybe the things that traditionally we haven't associated with French sides. And suddenly we're there thinking they're getting out of these tight games against good sides because they're more they're, they're applying themselves better because they're more disciplined. But actually, from the inside, it looks different. You know, yeah, someone yeah. like Maxime Mermoz, who crikey was a good player, uh, you know. Mark Lievremont, when he was coaching the side, called him undroppable. Mm. He was a really, really good player. Not the biggest, you know, name in English terms, but a heck of a player. Um, and he's looking at it and thinking, actually, this isn't this isn't what people think it is. And again, he made a very good point about, I mean, looking back a little bit now, World Cup, they were in a soft ball. Other than the first match... Oh. And they only played the second 40 minutes of that first match. They didn't get a hit out until the quarterfinal. No. So, again, you know, um, that helps explain the World Cup dynamic. Uh, but throwing it forward to the tournament now, yes, they weren't perhaps in any way near as good shape 
mentally or physically as we thought. And uh, and my God, what an important win that was last week. Yeah. Now, looking back, there's no way they could have lost that, you think. But if they had lost that match, my God, they'd be in trouble. Gautier would be in trouble now, wouldn't he? Oh, crazy. out thinking. Crikey. Serious trouble. And and it it was a game, and we 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 discussed this previously it, it, on a, on our previous podcast. I mean, it was weight and power off the bench that won that game for them. Yeah, that you know, Wales stopped coaching when the second heavyweight pack came on. Yeah, yeah. that was when a, t a a smaller, tiring Welsh side found themselves unable to hack it. Yeah. Um. But but without that, you know, it, it wasn't a pretty victory. No, no, it was decisive and it was, um, it relieved the pressure big time, but it wasn't a pretty victory, no. If you are going to try and find an explanation for our shoddy France Grand Slam predictions at the start of this tournament, I suppose that interview with Maxime just then has given a pretty decent answer, just in terms of the fact that obviously the individual talent, which you see in the top 14, and you also see those units working very well. He spoke about the Bordeaux halfback unit. Yeah, yeah off back unit it cannot possibly translate into a team where you're right you're there for a few weeks you're maybe not particularly managed particularly well and also then you're obviously starved of said talent in the form of Dupont and Tamak obviously Aldrit has missed a game or two maybe just one game now um, but it's a pretty decent explanation as to why we were sort of so tunnel vision France, their domestic game. I shall be quoting him extensively in future articles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean look, look, you you can make you can make a case, can't you? I, I mean, the, the French team pre World Cup when it was operating at its hottest, a hell of a lot of that side um, either picked up long term injury. And then and then and then we're coming back and we're quite what they were and that's probably the case with someone like Cyril Bay, it's you know someone like Olivon is is back now but maybe not playing at the at the fever pitch that he was he was playing you know six months or a year before, you know in in the in the Six Nations before the World Cup when they were they were extraordinarily um, impressive players Gelon very important to them. And, you know, he's in a pickle. We've discussed Cameron Wocky, who, and Maxime said, you know, in the, in a couple of the games that they played against New Zealand, he looked like the absolute epitome of a modern, game-changing, mobile, ball-playing, line-out winning lock. Absolutely fabulous range of talents. But, you know, Maxime's told us that it's um, it's not quite together for one reason or another, mostly to do with social media, it seems. You've lost Dupont. They've lost Entomac. Um, Dante, you know, seems, you know, he's he's not fit enough to pay more than 20 minutes, so he gets himself sent off. Um, they so, lost Clement, so, who was so, an important so, player, and but, did very well when he came uh, back. Uh, you know, it, it's that, that side... At one stage or another, has sort of been in bits. Yeah, they're still on the field. Most of them are still on the field, but they're not quite what they were when they were at their fittest and firing at their at their, at their hottest. Yeah. However, I would say it's quite worrying, not worrying, challenging for England this weekend. And it, it, we know we do our you know predictions two months ago, basically, and it's always tempting to change them. This is the one weekend I'm feeling a bit nervous because you really would be tempted to I think France will be all the better for that win yeah. and can England back up what we agree was one of their best performances in modern times so that's absolutely fascinating dynamic I think I've gone down for a draw I don't know what made me think that <laughs> I, I think I think the odds slightly favor France now uh, and then with the, the the Wales you know the Wales Italy one um, I like to think I went for a fairly close score line but I just thought home advantage but obviously Italy are now on a bit of a roll and we weren't necessarily expecting that either. Yeah. So if we were predicting a new, I think we might have a rethink this weekend. But the fun of it is trying to do it two months ago. Well, exactly. We've got two draws predicted this weekend because Chewy, you predict Chewy, you're top of the league, but obviously a draw, you shoot yourself in the foot with the, the predictions league because it's so hard to get the, the result correct and so unlikely. You've got a draw between Ireland and Scotland. It's not about the winning for me. Um, Ollie, it's, it's about, about the, the taking. Drawing. It's about the taking part. I'm, I'm a sort of latter day Corinthian. 
Just a, a reminder that you are top of the league, so you. I well, that's 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 his maybe. But... Smell the roses. Go on, smell the roses, yeah. Chad. Yeah. It um, doesn't happen very that's, often. That's why you're you've never been on the pitch and you've always been beside it reporting, Chris. I've I feel um yes. Well well that that that's that's probably true. Um I mean any 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 time I actually played in, in what's laughably called my rugby career, I, it, it was really a triumph over my own cowardice just to take the field. <laughs> so it, it 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 wasn't it wasn't as though I, I took the um I took the sort of Abdul Benazi, Michel Palmier approach to I'm going to go out there and duff everyone up. Yeah, it's um, it was just getting through a game and feeling good about myself because I conquered a weak part of myself. Oh God, it was philosophical stuff here. Well, deeply, deeply philosophical, and um, and um, on philosophical stuff, I've got a little suggestion about Scotland because all, Twitter's been alive this week about why Scotland can't finish things off, why they can't. Act calmly and correctly. No, no. What was Woodward's expression? Teacup thinking correctly under thinking pressure. Thinking correctly under pressure. Yeah. They just keep blowing leads, don't they? And the only thing I can think of is that if you look at the DNA of their team, they've got they've got no winners, have they? Glasgow and Edinburgh, and unless I've missed something, have never won any sort of European trophy. Uh, I think Glasgow did win the Gla Glasgow Celtic won League once. What is now the URC, one. didn't they? When, yeah. when Gregor was when Gregor was. Yeah. But even Finn, did Finn win big trophies in France? He played very, very well. So I'm just sort of so, so, you know, searching for a reason why Scotland can't close out games. They should win. And it seems to me that they are a little bit short on that hard edge winning now. Is that fair? Yeah, well, I, I, think that's, I think that's true. Also, I, I, in, in, at the end of the day, they're not strong enough off the bench. Um. They're not really good enough at lock much as much as I much as I admire Gilchrist and Cummins and the and the Greys. They're bloody good players. I mean, it'd be ridiculous to say that they weren't. But I don't think at the very top level they are um, and and it and Itoje and uh, and uh, whoever you know. It's um, they're they're not they're not quite. There, that's a slight weakness in their game. So they don't have the tight options to go to. They can't close um, the game down when they. No, it. they can't close. They can't close the game down. No, that, I think that's um, that's a good point actually. Um, it, it's it's very difficult for them, and you know Finn's got all the skills in the world, but it, it, it was it was patently obvious, I thought, against Italy, how much they missed two Pilotto. Yeah. yeah, and and I, I, you know, that's not to say that Cam Regpath isn't a good player. He's a terrific player, but you know, defensively, when they needed a shut up shop, they didn't have the people on the field who were particularly brilliant at shutting up shop. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right. Um, just going back to what we were saying about England, I think it's interesting. Obviously, what's been reported about the Wales game, the France Wales game, that is is Wales knew exactly what was coming, but they couldn't stop it. And you just wonder, I know Maxime said that England look a bit heavy and, well, that's maybe one of the things I didn't necessarily agree with too much. I think England's pack is more mobile than, it, than it's been, certainly um, the back row. How do England stop what's coming, which is at 50, 55 minutes, you're bringing on, you're, you're taking a tired 300 kilos off the tight side and you're bringing on a fresh 300 kilos. How how do England combat that? Do they combat that or do they run a France pack ragged for as long as they possibly can by playing a high tempo game like they did against Ireland and just hope that both of these new packs or both packs get tired? Well, it's a classic dilemma and it, I, I look forward to, Chris coming off his long run this weekend. I think he's going to really dive into this um, replacements business. But absolutely, you know, I'd want and love to see England play like they played last week. You know, that was what the England I want to see, the high tempo. And the high tempo is not just running the ball willy-nilly. It's doing everything at speed and with purpose. And that should get its reward later on. But you know against this French team now that that, if you if you haven't got this lead, I think I think that's what Murmur was, uh, Maxine was trying to say at one stage. You know, you have to you have to make the fast start. Hey, you have to get the lead. If you can't do that, you know what's coming, and then, therefore you think, well, do we pack the bench so we can somehow resist that? Do we go six two or even the South African route seven one? 
and get some really big units on the bench. And this is going to be a dilemma for England this week. I'm going to be fascinated with the selection, actually, how they go about this. Well, I, I, I was slightly surprised that Maxine thought that um, that the England pack on the basis of last Saturday was sort of one-paced. Um, but, it, but it is true that if you're going to play chess and at six, that ain't the most mobile. Um, and, and then it, it it depends what you mean by by mobility. I mean, if it, I mean, it didn't it didn't seem to me that England were playing in the furthest reaches of the field on Saturday. What they did was they did what they did at a ferocious temper, mm. and it discomforted Ireland. Who are used to playing the game at their games at their pace because they're so organised and they're so aware. They're so much on the same page and so aware of their game plan. And, you know, they've been able to control those things, but th but things bust up for them. You know, Gibson Park wasn't the scrum half for as long as he usually is. And he's absolutely key to them. And it was a very tight game. I do think there's a bit of an overreaction. David Flatman, I see, put out um, put out a tweet after the game saying, and it, he was joking, does this now mean England are number one in the world? Well, South Africa are number one in the world, so it's, it's done from a, it was done from a slightly wrong, wrong basis anyway. But... There is there, there's a danger of overreaction. It was a terrific game, Twickenham on Saturday, and it was played at a very, very high pace. But really, one swallow doesn't make a summer. Uh, so England need to back that up. They got a couple of players who are playing absolutely out of their skin. Ben Earl is on a golden streak. Absolutely brilliant and fair, fair play to the guy. Outstanding. Um, you know, Alex Mitchell's return made a big difference. Yes, they've got to move that. I think they have to move that French pack around. But what they have to do more than anything is play that tempo. Because there's no way on earth that the Miafus and uh and 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 the the Coloms and the Atonios and what have you will want to be playing for very, very long at very high speed. And in that respect, it's a huge shame that um Cunningham himself has picked up this injury. Yeah. Because you know, if if, if you're thinking how can England counter a team like France off the bench. Well, if you're going to go down that route of hitting fast and hard, running them off their feet, my God, you want him in, in action, don't you, all the time? I don't know, this might be the match where Alex Cole gets a bit of a, a, a on the bench, um, very mobile unit, can cover the back five, you know, because England have got to think how they're going to match France off the bench. So, yeah, in, interesting selection coming up, I'd say. I think we should go over the permutations for Saturday. Obviously, I did mention at the start of the episode, four teams can technically win it. Um, and I say technically in the sort of loosest sense of the word. So obviously, Ireland win in Dublin, it's lights out. They've won the championship. If Ireland lose without a winning bonus point and England win with a bonus point, England win the championship. Scotland need to win by 80 points against Ireland, which is less likely. And mm. France need to win by 80 points against England, and they need Ireland to lose without getting anything from Scotland, which is even less likely. So that's the sort of permutations for Saturday. The flip side of it is, is obviously Wales and Italy are fighting for the wooden spoon, um, which is, I, I think, up there with, you know, England, well, with the other two games in terms of fascination. Yeah. Um, Italy, actually Wales haven't gone winless since actually go on, pop quiz trivia, how long since Wales have, have gone winless in the Six Nations well, I think I read, oh, I read 2003 was it? That was a, I think, last year that was, that, was the, that was the last time Wales finished bottom wasn't it? yeah uh, but I think winless is winless might be even uh, no, 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 they were winless in 2003 were they winless in 03? They were, yeah, yeah so, You're absolutely right on it. It's a it's a it's a really good fixture. This one, I mean, it is okay. It's for the wooden spoon, but it is actually for something. And for Italy to finish fifth would be major. And Wales, despite all their rebuilding and young squad, they won't want to finish bottom. And there's another interesting dynamic. I cannot think of an Italy match, and I've covered most of them where they go to a match as favourites. Yeah, and they probably go a uh, Six Nations match as favourites, and they probably just about go as favourites, although, you know, home advantage and Wales, I think, have picked their strongest team, bar none, this time. Although, have they ever gone three games without, uh, have they ever gone three games undefeated, Italy? In the uh, Six Nations? Well, they've only ever won two matches in any one Six Nations tournament, so I think you'd have to say 
that that is probably right. They've probably never gone three matches undefeated in the championship. Obviously, it, yeah, if they win on Saturday, this is their best Six Nations return in terms of stats because of bonus points and points difference, etc., yeah. which is a separate issue we may get into after the tournament, depending on how the table finishes. It may not be their best ever finish. Their best ever finish is fourth in 2007. And Brendan, help me out, maybe 2013? Yeah, 2013, they won two matches and they yeah. beat Ireland at home in Rome. That was their last big home win, yeah. Yeah, well, there we go. Uh, did, I mean, I'll they, tell they you could, this. They finished third as well. They could. It is possible. This well, is, if this they is... got that win they deserved against France, you think what a good season this I know. could oh, have shaped up to it. Yeah. I think I think this is the best Italian side I've seen since possibly the, the, the Italian side that should have beaten England in 1998 in a World Cup qualifier at Huddersfield. Yeah. When they had... A, ter- a really terrific side. I mean, Giovanelli, Bergamasco and Parise, I think, were probably the back row that day. Um, you had Not that Parise back. wasn't, but uh, that was Bergamasco's debut. You, you Trump, had, he was just making his presence felt. Dominguez had, was just... Bortolami would have been playing. Bortolami. Uh, Troncon and Dominguez. Tutita I mean, that, brothers. Decent side. There. Very good side. Yeah. Um and and it's t- it's taken them a while, and there have been flickers, um, and some of us have some of us have um, wondered after long, long periods of really trying to be as supportive as possible of Italian rugby, we wondered whether they were becoming too much of a drag on the tournament. So you can't say that now. It's great. That's not to say that in my view there should still be promotion and relegation. I mean, how fascinating would that be? Yeah. This is a promotion relegation. This now. weekend. Loser goes into the playoff against Georgia or Paul. Oh, I mean, that would up the ante a bit, wouldn't it? Something else. Absolutely oh. brilliant. Um, so, hey, you know, may, may, maybe maybe we can revisit that at some point. But it's... Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I don't despair of Wales at all, though, as I, I wrote last week. I mean, I think they're on a decent track. They're, they're, they're having to swallow pretty hard at the moment because it's a very unfamiliar Welsh side. I mean, I mean that is an incredibly green team. And and I think that you know they they could have lost all four if they if that side had lost all four games by forty points I mean by a margin of forty points or thirty points let's say more realistically I don't think anyone would have fallen off their chair in shock seriously especially the way Scotland started in the first half in in the opening round mm-hmm. um, you know so I I think they can take a little bit of credit I mean they fed a hell of a lot of very very potential rich players into that side. And if a majority of them fulfill that potential over the next couple of seasons, I don't think um, I don't think they'll be in a bad place come next World Cup. And that they'll be revved up on Saturday. I mean George North retiring alone will ensure yeah. you know an emotional pitch yeah. um down there. Plus, you know, not wanting to, to be the wooden spoonist. No, I think that's got the making of a fantastic match. Uh, in fact, the whole weekend, you know, when you think about it, although you, it feels like it's done and dusted, you know, there's going to be, all, let's let's be honest, I'd be amazed if Ireland don't clinch the championship. But there's going to be a right old dust up for second place. Um, and that's worth having at the moment. And it's a, a clear cut wooden spoon shootout. You know, there's there's a lot of interest there. Yeah. And above all, there are three results that are ultimately very, we're not unanimous in any of the results with our prediction. No. One. Granted, I think Ireland, Scotland, given Ireland's record at home and Chewie's just predicted a draw, he's the only exception. I think that probably is maybe a little bit more of a sure thing, no disrespect to Scotland. But the other two games I find really, really difficult to call. Um, so that will be very, very interesting to see. What has the um, missing I'm... maestro gone with, with for France, England? Who? who? Nick Kane, the missing maestro. Oh, the missing maestro, sorry. He has gone with... He went with a France win. We all did except... No, we've all gone for a France win except you, Brendan. He's gone 35-23 to France. So also quite a big gap. Chewie's got quite the smallest gap of four points um, by you, Brendan. Also. I'm not I'm not sure if I was doing the predictions now. I would put a lot of the money I don't have on a Scotland draw in Dublin on, on current evidence. Um, but I, th- I, th- I think... I think- what happened to them in Rome will shame them into a performance. Yeah, and and they they do owe Ireland something. I mean, I mean, you know, what once again Ireland took them to the cleaners really at the World Cup. 
they didn't buy much of a shot. So that's I think twice in succession, isn't it? That the the Scots have come against up against Ireland in 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 World Cup pool games and 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 not shown really. Yeah. Right, so right. I I do think um I do think they'll they'll be quite charged. Um, well, that would have hurt them on well. that would have hurt them on Saturday, because actually, a decent Scotland victory, um, as I would have expected them um, to record in Rome. And you know they they'd have had three wins and a and a very narrow and a well they could have gone in on what should have been four wins, yeah. Um, um, so. And they would have obviously had a shot. At, well, you beat Ireland and you get a decent points difference and you won the title. Well, they would have had a very good chance at that, which they obviously well they have a chance. But I mean, I was speaking to one uh, Nick Powell before, and he said weirder things haven't happened. <laughs> well, in, in, in fact, I mean, I mean if the, yes, if they'd, um, I, I wish for their sake that the, that the that the officials had just got the thing at the end of the French game right, and and Maxine was absolutely right. That was a shocking call, yeah, an absolutely shocking call. Well, Nigel Owens next week on will definitely have a few refereeing um, things to discuss. Of course. I was um, just for fun. I was comparing our predictions league to this time last year, and I should say that obviously we don't explain the point system because no one cares, to be honest. Um, but there is a a point system that we use consistently year on year, and it's a, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's the same. It's the same system every year, um, and I, I won't explain it. But basically, this year, Chewy, you're first with the special guest on fifty six points. Last year, first place by this point was on 75 points. <laughs> so <laughs> we've collectively got quite a lot. And the, there were three other people out of the four, uh, out of the five, sorry, who were also above first place this year. So we've got collectively some. We've had a mayor this year, is what you're saying. We've, we've had an absolute shock. There's so many turkeys and wrong results. And... So what you're saying is if I win this, and I've already told you how much it matters to me, yeah. if I win this, then I've won it in a crap year. It's a wooden. It's the wooden spoon of victories. Is yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that 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 suits me because I do a lot of cooking, and believe me, a wooden spoon is more use than a trophy. Well, no, but look, I'll give you your credit. If you win this, you win this having predicted a draw, which no one has ever done. Um, so that would be a very very impressive way to win it. But yeah, so you're on fifty six along with a special guest who this week is Maxime. I'm on 52. Brendan, you've roared back into contention, having been last by some way, thanks to your Italy win prediction at the weekend. You're on 50. And then the missing maestro, Nick, is bringing up the rear again, having finished last last year on 49. So we'll find That's out. That's tight down at the basement is what you were saying. Exactly, exactly. But <laughs> much like the Six Nations, there are still probably four people who could still win it. Um, but again, weirder things haven't happened if Brendan you go on to win it. <laughs> right. So Chris Hewitt is the island of the predictions table. No, I think Max given he's predicted a draw, I think Maxime is the island. He's in top shape. Right. Yeah, I think he's the favorite. Yeah. Um, well, we're three days away. Obviously, a lot of questions will be answered. And yeah, like I say, Nigel Owens will be on next week. So don't miss that, guys. Enjoy the weekend and I'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe through our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.